Hey, what's going on, guys? I hope you guys are having a good day. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, the Black Business School. And uh, I wanted to uh, say hello to everybody who's here and to let you all know that um, uh, we every month get uh, the privilege and the opportunity to hear from uh, a man that is uh, uh, that is literally irreplaceable, that is literally one of a kind, that has literally changed the world, that literally has solutions for our community that literally will change your life and will literally make things better for everybody who listens. Uh, his name is Dr. George C. Frazier. Now, you may know uh, Dr. Frazier. He wrote a, uh, among many things that he's done, he's not just the founder of Frazier Nation uh, it, it slash Frazier Net as well, uh, but he, in the, uh, the, uh, the Power Networking Conference. But he also wrote a book called Success Runs in Our Race, which is a, a huge, huge best-selling book. Uh, sells 40,000 copies a year. It's required reading at every HBCU in America. And so uh, without further ado, I hope you guys will uh, join me in giving a big digital round of applause to Mr. George C. Frazier. How are you doing today, brother? I'm doing wonderful, man. Good to see your smiley face. It really is. Uh, I love your smile, right? I mean, you're, you're, when you smile, this is interesting. Not only does your whole face smile, your body smiles and your and your bald head smiles. I don't know how <laughs> you <pull> it off. <laughs> you have that kind of you have that thing going for you, man. Um, so it's just, it's, uh, I, I just feel good looking at you. You know, you inspire me just through your aura and your your chemistry and your energy. So it's well, good well, to be back. Well I appreciate that man. Thank you. I I you know I I um yeah, well, I, nobody's ever said that before. But but I I appreciate that compliment. It's you know it's it you know every day you wake up and and you have a choice. I feel like you have a choice. You can smile or you can frown. You know you can be happy or unhappy. You can be optimistic or pessimistic. And and I I literally believe in optimism like a religion. You know I, I think I think mm -hmm. there's always something to be thankful for. And so uh, that's where the smile comes from. It's 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 true gratitude for everything, including people like yourself, man. So let let me um. Let me dig into this. First of all, everybody who's in here, please uh, hit the thumbs up button if you haven't done this yet. I want to say hi to everybody on Instagram. Instagram is The Real Voice Watkins. So make sure you follow us on Instagram and also follow the Black Financial Channel on Instagram. Just look up the Black Financial Channel and you'll find it there. Um, so let's jump right into this conversation. Um, you and I were talking about uh, this wonderful continent called Africa, um, where there's a lot of interesting stuff happening that uh, that our people should know about. Um, you just took a trip to Africa, and I, and I felt like it was important to kind of talk about um, that trip and, and your perception on some of these issues, because uh, Africa is a big part of the Black conversation right now um, in the in the African American slash Black community, ADOS community, whichever whatever people want to describe it. Um, so tell us about your trip and uh, and what you learned. Yeah, well, I'm I'm just getting in. I just arrived uh, last night. Um, a 23 hour journey from South Africa. That was the tale of the trip from Johannesburg to JFK, JFK to Cleveland, where I live, and all of that took 24 hours. And uh, Johannesburg is six hours ahead of us. Um, so I'm still sort of crazy on, on time and trying to get the right, adjust my sleep. But it was um, a very profound trip for me at this stage in my life. And so much so that on the trip back, um, I sort of wrote to myself my personal reflections of taking this trip um, at 70, nearly 75 years old. And I've been sending it out and I'm going to be sending it out and putting it on social media. But I, I want you to indulge me for a moment. So rather than try to repeat what I wrote, I'm simply going to read it because there's a powerful piece to it. Uh, and then there is a, a, a piece that really makes us all think. And I think I would classify this piece that I'm going to read, and I didn't write it, I didn't say it. A, a white gu English guitarist named Richard Smith, I don't know if you've seen it yet, said this in an interview not long ago. And he is an award-winning guitarist, a realist and from Britain. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this little piece and then we can have a discussion out of this piece. I, I, th I think you'll find that uh, 
the discussion that will emanate as this piece gets out among black folk in America. Uh, but it is um, brutally honest. So let me so let me just read you what I wrote. Um, uh, and I title it what I've reflected on and learned in my 12 days and three country tour uh, to include the words of Richard Smith. That's really how I title it. I said, a very important journey at 75 years old, 12 days, three countries, now my 31st trip to the Pan-African diaspora. Here is what I have reflected on and learned over and over. It is best expressed in a brutally honest way by the white British guitarist Richard Smith in an interview he did not long ago. The words of Richard Smith of late are profoundly true now 2,000 years later. In 12 awesome days of meetings, visitations, and 40 U.S. business delegates, I saw and heard nothing that would defy the brutally true diatribe below from Richard Smith. It was true when he said it, and it is true now. No one will save us but us but it will require bleeding edge vision, work, and leadership. Additionally, I saw and heard nothing to change my mind about the critical need for the Fraser Nation vision. One of the leaders in the Pan-African Parliament in Johannesburg, where I spoke and gave a major presentation, stood up and literally said, and I paraphrase, Fraser Nation and its idea of the digitalization to facilitate global nationhood is the most visionary and greatest ideas I have heard, end of quote. Here are the brutal words of Richard Smith, a famous British guitarist, and he said these words during an interview. I have been asked many times what I think of Africans. Here is what I think of Africans, without language and without taboos. They sell everything to the highest bidder, even the land. Then they poison themselves with everything that is edible. Look at their pastors or so-called men of God. They rob their congregations and become billionaires in very poor nations. The churches become family inheritance, the father, the mother, children, and other business interests. I am not racist because I do not believe for a single second that I am superior to a black man. The difference with them is that we think of our descendants, we are calculators, we protect our interests, and we'll kill for that even if need be. We are not emotional. He's talking about Europeans. We have passed this stage. If the lion has pity on the gazelle, it is he who will die from hunger. They have lions at home, but they do not understand the laws of nature. For everything they confide in superstition and religion, the difference between the others and blacks is, and I quote, while others reflect, blacks do not think. They do not use their intellectual capacity and very few blacks are analytical. And when a few black people pierce through, we admit to our side or eliminate them in one way or another, most often with the hand of other Blacks. We brought them our God and continuously invent fuzzy concepts to confuse them. In a hundred years, their descendants will be more slaves than they are now. They are already more unhappy than the generation of their parents, and they naively believe that numbers will be their strength. We force them to speak and write in our languages. They, ev they even judge each other by how much one can speak like us. We control their descendants more than we control them right now. It's happening already. 
Other people understand our game or understood our game, like the Chinese and the Indians and the Koreans. They started to use the same technical knowledge as us to protect and to dissuade, but the blacks do not understand anything. I am sorry to be so brutal in my franchise. Nothing personal. I'm just plain Richard Smith. Mm. <laughs> so this is this to me, Doc, is the next version of the Willie Lynch letter. Mm -hmm. This is a modern version, a modern take, or maybe even a modern spin on the Willie Lynch letter. Um, I mean... That's intense. <laughs> that's intense. That's intense. Now, certainly it's from his point of view as, as a European. And I think he said some very truthful things and some very hurtful things. And what I'm, what I'm saying is... In the context of this letter, I just spent two weeks in Africa hmm. evaluating where are the opportunities for strategic alliances, joint ventures, and partnerships for African Americans in the diaspora. What can we bring? How can we serve? How can we help? What did I say to the African dignitaries in Africa while I was there. And I had some pretty powerful forums. One, I spoke before the Pan-African Parliament in Johannesburg, and it was intense, very intense. And I began by saying to our African brothers and sisters, white people will not be saving black people that white people are not even thinking about black people. That wherever black people are going in the 21st century, it will be because black people will take them there, right? That's how I began. And then I talked about what African, old guard African leadership talked about that had fundamentally Africans done, had done what Nkrumah had asked them to do uh, when he was leading Ghana as the first African country to escape and to throw out the colonialists, had we done, had we followed his instruction, we would be a different people today. I've asked myself this question at 75 years old for years. Why, wherever you visit our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, diaspora, be it in the Caribbean, be it in South America, be it in, on, in any country in Africa. Why are we, 7,000 years later, the first builders of civilization, we basically civilized the world. Of course, they have flipped the script on us. They have, they're having the world believe that European civilized Africans, but we were building pyramids and solving complex engineering problems when other cultures were living in caves, eating each other. And the remnants and the, the monuments to that greatness 5,000 years before Christ still stand. So why, as God's first people, the first builders of the first great civilizations. Why are we today, no matter where you go in the diaspora, we are economically at the bottom of every single economic statistic in, uh, in, 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 in the world. Why is that? Yes, there has been some standout individual greatness, the great leaders. I don't know if there are any greater leaders that have ever lived greater than Mandela, greater than Malcolm, greater than Martin. Yes, there has been some great white leaders, but I'm talking about for Black people. We have had some great leadership. We have had some great successes, individual successes. Uh, our history is riddled with the likes of the 
Harriet Tubman's of the world and the Frederick Douglass's of the world and the inventions of black people that made our, our superiority in entertainment and in sports. But from a macro standpoint, we're still at the bottom. And, and, and economically, we have gained some political power all over the world. We can have political power in the Caribbean. We have political power uh, in the major countries in Africa, in all the countries in Africa. Um, but we, we still have no economic power. Um, and it, 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 is, it is challenging and it's discouraging. And as I'm now into the final passages of my life, I'm 75. Um, uh, I have, I'm on the downside of the mountain and I want to see more. Uh, and I believe that we have a moral responsibility as the elders to put something in place so our children will have a system and a structure that will enable them to leverage our position, our global position, to somewhat incrementally better in their generation and then pass it on to succeeding generations. So the trip was hopeful. Um reeking with potential and as i told the countries we cannot give you billions of dollars like the chinese we cannot write checks like russians can write checks right but we don't have an agenda of global dominance right um but what we do have is a hundred trillion dollars of social capital human capital intellectual capital and some capital Right, make no mistake about that. We have expertise, we have knowledge abound, um, and we can offer that up. You have natural resources, we have brain power. Um, and when you add the two together, not that those countries don't have their own brain power, yes, they do. Um, but we are the most educated and professionally trained Africans in the entire world. There are no black people in the entire world doing better than we are. In fact, we are the beacon of hope for every single person of African descent in the entire world. And we know that too much is given, much is required. But we are not being called upon uh, by our African-centered uh, uh, and African-centric brothers and sisters to utilize this knowledge. Now, maybe, I don't know what the disconnect is. Um, I don't know if there's still trust issues, um, but I know there was a talk uh, during our trip um, by a sister who was from the, um, the National Association of Black Psychologists, and I've forgotten her name. Uh, if you're, if you're watching, please don't kill me. But she gave a marvelous presentation on the woundedness of Black people, that we are not really who we should be, that we are still deeply damaged as a people individually and collectively. And it contributes to our disconnection. And as I said in my talk, not only are we dispersed, we are a disconnected people, and we've got to connect the dots. And we cannot get where we're going without Africa. And Africa mm -hmm. cannot get where it's going without us. That is, that's what um, uh, the uh, ambassador uh, of the African Union, the former ambassador of the African Union, Arakana Chiambore uh, Fail, was speaking about before she was summarily fired. Yeah, we need. Uh, let, let me jump in and ask you about that. I, I meant to ask you about that. I saw the sister speak, and I, I loved what she said at uh, the Fraser Nation at your Power Networking Conference. Um, uh, she actually inspired me quite a bit. Uh, can you speak on that? Actually, uh, from what I understand, she was let go because she was critical of France and their exploitation of the African continent. Uh, can you yeah, tell us your view? You know what happened and and how you felt when when that all took place. Um, the powers that be that terminated her 
said it was she was not fired because of her stand on the French. As you know, they're pulling $500 billion a year out of 14 countries in Africa, although they uh, are, 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 are not the colonialists as they once were, but those countries are paying France debt for infrastructure and things that they built. And that amounts to about $500 billion a year, which will drive them into poverty. Now, this is the same thing France did in Haiti, right? Well, the, the, the Haitians beat them and basically told them to leave Haiti. Um, and they agreed to leave, but the Haitians signed an agreement uh, to pay them $20 million or so a year to repay them for the work that they had done in Haiti during colonialism. And they could basically could not make that payment. And of course, that sent Haiti into poverty. Now we fast forward it to the 14 countries in Africa and the same thing. So she complained about that and she spoke very powerfully and our articulately about that, uh, but according to the powers to be of the African Union, that was not the reason she was fired. We don't know that to be true. They claimed it was some budgetary uh, abuse doing some things that she did not get permission to do. She summarily dismisses that, that because she had to report quarterly everything she was doing uh, to the powers to be uh, in Ethiopia, and uh, she never had a problem. So I believe it's because the stance that she had taken. I believe that in the three short years that she was the ambassador, that she informed more people, excite more people, excited more people, produced uh, more optimism, gathered more fans, basically a power base, than ever before of any ambassador from the Africa. So I think it was a power play. I think it was part of it. And um, I, I mean, prior to her, there was an ambassador who was around for about 11 or 12 years. And mm -hmm. no one even knew her name, hardly. I mean, no right. one talked about the African Union. No one knew very much. It was very quiet, very secretive. I mean, who knew and who cared until she came and she raised their profile. And I believe there was some underlying reasons that they do not want to admit to, but that seemed to be fairly obvious to those of us that engaged her and brought her into our networks and into our organizations and into uh, our, the places of power that we have. Uh, and that's what happened. Um, now, if you go on YouTube, there's several very interesting interviews with her since her firing, she did a very interesting interview with Roland Martin. Um, you should get her on your show. I think she would be willing to do it. She's going to stay in the United States. Uh, she had a very, very, uh, and maybe she still has a very, very successful medical practice. I believe it's in Tennessee. Her husband was a physician as well. So she could always go back to her, uh, to that. Uh, she was only paid forty nine thousand dollars a year as ambassador, so that was nothing. She was well, she wasn't doing well, it for money. She was doing it because she really felt that there needed to be a connection between Africans in the diaspora and um, uh, Africans on the continent, um, and and it just was not there. <laughs> So she rubbed some people the wrong way. I mean, that's what happens when you rub people the wrong way. You're saying something that perhaps threatens them or perhaps they don't like the way you say it and you're not the boss. And um, that's what happens. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you what, when I heard her speak, I was very inspired. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of great speakers when I went to the Power Networking Conference. Uh, that you host. And I encourage everybody listening to go to the conference. It's amazing. Um, but uh, I remember that uh, 
her speech actually brought me to tears. And I and I and I and it's funny sometimes when, when that ha when it happens, I don't cry much, but when it does, I almost never know why. I never know what's going to trigger it. And and uh, and I and I you know I'm, I'm going to marry this therapist next year, right? And uh, and so right. the, this therapist I'm going to marry, this beautiful black woman that I love so much, she tells me she, her theory is that I have attachment issues coming from the fact that I never knew my father, right? So so her theory is that as a as you know as a man who never knew his father, and I had a father at home though who, who was a great wonderful dad, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So but 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 I always in a way felt like a tree that didn't quite have its roots, if you know what I mean. And so when she kept saying, come home, come home to Africa, you know, come home, I felt like I had roots again. I said, okay, this is, this is it. You know, this, if I'm an Italian, you know, I found my Italy. If I'm Chinese, I found my China. Right. If I'm, you know, if, if I'm Mexican, I found my Mexico, you know, I found my base, right? If I'm Jewish, maybe I found my Jerusalem, you know, and, um, and I, re and I remember kind of thinking and contrasting that with the fact that, as, as African-American people, you know, I, I think it's pretty damn depressing to think that all we have is, you know, the U.S. as it is and Donald Trump and this white supremacist system. It, it doesn't mean that we don't have a right to the resources in America. Uh, we have a full claim to that and we should claim that. There's a whole reparations conversation occurring right now. And uh, one of the things, one of the things that I, um, I want us to be very careful about is that there, uh, you know, seems to have been become a very nationalist sort of, um, you know, uh, nationalist rhetoric that, you know, on one hand, it's necessary to say, for example, you know, uniquely as descendants of slaves, we're deserving of reparations because our experience was different from everybody else's. That part of the argument I get with 100 percent, I I'm follow that in lockstep, et cetera. The part I don't like is when we're acting as if we have nothing in common with Africa. Um, I think this idea that we have nothing in common with Africa and that there's no connection point with Africa, that to me is a, a white supremacist construct. That's what, that's what you know, the racist school system put into your head. That's what the right. racist media put into your head. Many of us don't see the opportunities in Africa and don't take advantage of the opportunities uh, because we've never had a desire to go there <clears throat> because it's never been presented to us in a way that is accurate to the fact that we have also, in addition to our rightful claim in the United States, we have a rightful claim to a to the wealthiest continent on the planet, uh, the, to the continent that has the greatest, most abundant uh, resources of any place on earth. So, so I personally will say, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying, I'll, I'll let you, Dr. Frazier, please take over, but, but I'm here to just tell everybody, um, I encourage you to not feel that you have to take on this idea that you ain't got nothing in common with Africa, uh, because you do, you know, and, and I don't care if you got if you you know if you, if your bloodline is twenty six percent Scottish, uh, you know, or or, or you know thirty three percent Irish. <laughs> we know how that happened. You, it's because your great 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 grandmama got raped, right? That's what it is for many of you, uh, and and that's not the part of me that I'm interested in. I, I want that piece of me that you know has that bloodline in West Africa, you know, and so um, I think that just as a baby step, I think that we all definitely should ensure that when we talk to our children, you know, and we get that passport, we remind them of the importance of using that passport to go to Africa uh, so you can see for yourself what's there and, and see that as part of your long-term diversified um, economic base development strategy. You know, if we build black, as we're building Black Wall Street, if we build it all on domestic soil, if we root it all in the United States, then I believe that can be easily taken away from us. What the diaspora offers us is a, a strategy where we can be globally diversified and, and, and not sort of be burned down and taken down so easily because just because somebody changed the law or somebody decided to come and attack or whatever the case may be. So so I, I'm, I'm all for this idea of connecting with Africa. That's why I agreed to go to um, Ghana on December 6th with Michael Roberts, whom I met because of you, by the way. Thank you very much for that. And so I, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on just anything that I just said. I'm not even going to ask it as a question because I'm sure you have a ton of things you'd like to say on, on all these issues. Yeah. Now, you know, I want to focus for a moment on one country. I have been to South Africa three times, but I had not been in the last 15 years. 
The country with the greatest opportunity, as far as I am concerned, for African Americans to do business is in South Africa. I don't know, Doc, the last time you've been to South Africa. Have you been to South Africa? Yeah, I was there in 2014, and it was awesome. That, oh my God. Johannesburg, I don't know if there is a city in America that is better than Johannesburg in terms of how it looks, its infrastructure, its roads, its hotels. I mean, it is a, it, I think it's the wealthiest country in Africa. I think Nigeria is number two. I mean, it is incredible. The range of black people, by the way, this is an aside, one of the most beautiful, beautiful collection of black women I have ever seen any place in the world, right? Well beyond Rio, right? Yes, there are Africans in Rio and Bahia, but these sisters, all different shades, skin tones, hair textures, body styles and shapes, beautiful, smart people. Yes, they have a large poor population that 1.2 million that live in Soweto. Um, uh, and Soweto still needs a lot of room for improvement. But generally speaking, there is tremendous opportunity for us in Africa, especially on the entrepreneurial side. Something very odd has happened to Black people and entrepreneurship in South Africa. As you know, black people control the political infrastructure in South Africa. White folks still control everything that makes money, right? Make no mistake about that. They are in fact uh, trying to develop uh, a black owned bank in South Africa. Now here's a country that is 90% black and 8% white. <laughs> this is 90% black, 90% black and 8% white. And black people control a micro percentage of the economics of that country. All right. Now, the interesting thing is that black people run all of the businesses, all you go into hotels, you go into anything that's generating fabulous malls, and there's nothing but black people running everything. Well, of course, it's 90% of the population, right? That's the labor force, but they don't own anything, right? They just run everything. And they believe, and one of the leaders said to me, and I again, I paraphrase, that we cannot take the risk of going into business because we have too much to lose. That's what he said to me. This is a business leader. I said, well, that's completely the opposite of how we think as Black people in America, that if we don't take risks, we have too much to lose. You're saying if you do take risks, you have too much to lose. And what do you have to lose? You have to lose jobs. And that's exactly right. People, black folks would begin losing jobs. So, but there is a desire by black people to own businesses in South Africa. And only a micro percentage of them do. There are some successful black business people, a restaurant here, a small business there, but that is not the overall trending mindset of South Africans, right? But they want to move into that direction. And duh, if you're 90% of the population, 85% uh, of the workforce, you're running every damn thing anyway, you already know how to do it, you're being trained how to do it, why can't you own it, right? The future for Black people will be equity and ownership, right? Not necessarily just jobs, but equity and ownership. So here's breaking news on your show. 
This is breaking news. Breaking news on this podcast. Hopefully this will go viral. In 2022, we will be bringing the Power Networking Conference to Johannesburg, South Africa in a Pan-African Business Conference. Breaking news on your show. All right? You guys in the chat. Brothers and sisters listening, save your money. You want to be there. It will be a Pan-African Business Conference under the Power Networking brand in 2022. And our business power brokers will meet with them, their business power brokers, their government leadership, and we will begin crafting strategic alliances, joint ventures, and partnerships. It's going to take us about two years to fully plan it. We already have a working committee of 35 people in South Africa because I announced this in the parliament. People stood up and applauded and they said, how can we volunteer? How can we be on the committee? They don't have these kinds of conferences, right? In South Africa for black people. They have them all day for white people, but not for black people. So we are headed, this is, so the, the, by that time, the Power Networking Conference will be 21 years old, right? Mm-hmm. We'll be doing our 22nd conference in Johannesburg, South Africa, and it will be like we are doing the conference in New York City. That's the kind of energy and the kind of amenities and the kind of luxury and the kind of 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 a cultural environment. But remember now, when you go to South Africa, you're gonna see nothing but black people, mm. beautiful black people, educated black people. But they have jobs. All of them have wonderful jobs, right? Every major corporation in America has a regional office in South Africa. Right. So they're working in these beautiful skyscrapers and offices. So we're going to help begin the process of turning them entrepreneurial. All right. So 2022 Power Networking Conference, Pan-African Business Conference under the Power Networking brand. And we want you on the faculty, Dr. Boyce. We want you on the faculty. You're going we're going to, we're going to ex, ext, extend the reach of this powerful podcast to South Africa. Yes. Now, I, I know you have you have um, uh, listeners and viewers in Africa. I know you do uh, because several people who saw me on your show when I was in Ghana and several in Senegal as well uh, uh, asked me, uh, do you really know Dr. Boyce Watkins? And uh, I said, yes, I really, I really know. So you have followers. They, they get you in some, but I, no, no, no one asked me that in South Africa, but maybe it was just happenstance or circumstances, but uh, whatever, we are going to expand the reach of this powerful podcast to South Africa, where the money is, where the opportunity is. And, um, now, remember, the conference in South Africa will be heavily populated, majority populated by South Africans, right? Mm-hmm. And then the real aggressive business people uh, who are African American will take their place at the conference as well. But I love it it. Be, we're hoping there will be, we did some estimates while we were there. They wanted us to do it for 3,000 people. Right. Mm-hmm. And I said, we, we don't we don't really do conferences that size anymore. We used to because you really can't do we really can't get granular and, and do the working coaching uh, training that we want to do with small groups. That's really the whole art and science of the power networking conference. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. We'll look at that. But that's an announcement that is going to happen. And uh, we want you a part of that. Don't well, put that on your calendar. Where it's probably going to be in the May time frame. Uh, it will be the exact same timeline 
is when the Pan-African Parliament meets in South Africa. So we will do something. Part of our conference will be in the Pan-African Parliament as well. Right. So they have an amphitheater. Uh, uh, you may have seen some of the pictures that can hold about a thousand people. We will have one of our sessions in the Pan-African Parliament. We, we, in uh, fact, we had Dr. Boyce Watkins speaking to the Pan-African Parliament. Right. Well, but I, 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 that, is, that is very exciting. And I, and I want you to know, Dr. Frazier, everybody in the chat, I'm looking at the chat, and uh, people are super excited. They're throwing up thumbs up and wait, uh, this is awesome. And I'll be there. I'm in, I'm in. Everybody's screaming. I, I, I can just hear them screaming, at, you know, at their, at their desks. Uh, and um, and I, I know, I know I personally obviously plan to be there. I'm definitely going to be there. And I think uh, also people should know how great the Power Networking Conference is in general. Um, you know, in the United States, you're going to have a couple more conferences here as well. And everybody should come. Uh, everybody should come. It's a great way. Uh, if you are a networker, which I've, I've told you guys, uh, part of the reason I'm always happy to have you on here, Dr. Frazier, I, I talk about you when you're not here, by the way, um, is I really believe that you possess a few of the secrets that we need to internalize as Black people in order for us to succeed. Um, you know, your, your gospel seems to be deeply connected to the idea of connecting with one another, coming together. You know, you always say, uh, oh, you know, all we need is each other. And I, I've heard you say that. And, you know, when you look actually at economic theory, uh, economic theory actually says that when people come together, wealth naturally creates itself. Uh, That's it creates, right. you know, yeah. In fact, wealth, well-being, all forms of wealth and capital, social, as you mentioned, social capital, human capital, just emotional relationship capital, and, and then financial capital comes together when you come together, right? It, it just, there's right. something magical that occurs when there's, because there's trade, there's lots of trade, people connecting and like you and I, how you and I work together and we trade and, and we, you know, and you've introduced me to trading partners and we just, we're trading, right? That, and that trade creates wealth. And so, um, you know, I, I, I want, I want you, if you could, um, you know, just going back to this idea. And, and by the way, I want to tell everybody that this is why you go to the Power Networking Conference because there are, really good people that look like you that you can form trading relationships with. Uh, we picked up probably five business partners at that convention, at that conference. It was, it was unbelievable. And, um, and so I'd love it if you could uh, help us get to that core as we're sort of working to shift the culture. Because right now we have, uh, and, uh, and you guys tell me in the chat if you know what I'm talking about, we have a lot of what they call cancel culture, which isn't mm -hmm. just done on a, on a macro scale, it's done on a micro scale. You know, you have people that cancel their friends because they voted for Donald Trump. And, you know, I voted for the Democrats. You vote for the Republicans. I'm canceling you. Right. I'm killing that relationship because of some guy in Washington who doesn't care about either one of us. Right. Right. Uh, you know, or, or or I'm mad at you because you traumatized me and upset me because because black people we kind of traumatize each other because of what we've all gone through. Right. And, and, and then next thing you know, businesses fall apart. Families fall apart. Um, you know, marriages, et cetera, fall apart. Uh, and every time that occurs. What I see is I see a huge emotional and economic loss, right? You know, you, you start off with a business partner, they disappoint you, the business dissolves, everybody's, you know, financially hurt, and, and you're not winning the way you would if you work together. And so I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I kind of hang out a little bit in the internet space, and, and right now around the whole issue of reparations, uh, there's been huge setbacks because there are lots of key players in that whole debate who are th launching nuclear missiles at each other and, and attacking other black people because of slight disagreements. Like I, I said tomato, you said tomato, that person's a terrible person, they're a fraud, I, I, I screw them, F them, blah, 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 blah. And, right. and so, so, so here's what I'm seeing, Dr. Frazier, right? When, when I see, you know, say two powerful people fighting, let's say, let's say one is level nine in power, the other was level seven, and, and they're, they're fighting, right? So the level nine guy, is going to defeat the level seven guy, but the level seven guy can do some damage, right? So he goes right. all in. And then, so at the end of the war, at the end of the, the battle, you've got nine minus seven is equal to two, right? <laughs> so he's, he's, one guy's got zero because he's just, he's been annihilated. The other one has two because he's been handicapped. And the guy who has the two stands up and says, I won, I won. You know, I, I'm the last one standing. And I'm sitting there thinking, you actually didn't win. Uh, because in war, there really usually isn't a winner. There's only the biggest loser, right? And, and you think you won because he lost more than you did. But actually, you both lost because you forgot one simple fact, one simple mathematical reality that 
nine minus seven does equal two, but nine plus seven could have equaled 16. That's right? right. So, so, so if you had remembered that basic idea that the best way to defeat an enemy is to find common ground and turn that enemy into a friend, if you can, then you could have found your synergy and, and, and built off one another. Now, it's one thing if you have a, a, a naturally diametric opposition to the other person, you know, let's say they're a white supremacist and you're not, and, and then you have a natural battle there. But, but I literally am seeing black people who, all, who agree on the same, who agree 80% of the time fighting because of that last 20% where they don't agree. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is the sickest thing in the world because you're killing your natural allies. So with mm -hmm. you being an expert on networking and the power of coming together and the power of, of building as opposed to destroying, could you kind of put some context on this, some wisdom that people can walk away with so that we can learn uh, just that we got to find a way to come together and, and, and kind of stop some of this nonsense that, that we sort of see, you know, uh, in media and on the on the big stage? Um, that's a great question because it came up one country after another. And the, the question was simple. Uh, what is the key to building a business? What is the key to business? And it came up in all kinds of panel discussions and no one really answered it correctly. I answered it at the end, but it's simple. So, so let's first revert to um, a Nigerian proverb. In the moment of crisis, the wise build bridges and the foolish build dams. In the moment of crisis, the wise build bridges and the foolish build dams. So that describes what you talked about in terms of a level nine and a level seven. If I'm a level nine, my number one goal is to get the level seven to, num to level nine. That's my number one goal, is to get the level seven, to help the brother or sister, that seven, to get to nine so that we can, we can avoid one and one making two and get one plus one making 11. That's really what we're trying to do. The key to building businesses is relationships. Business is about relationships. Without relationships, you have no business. Without relationships, you have no business being in business. In fact, the business we're all really in is in the business of building relationships. Not long ago, and I have it down here, I was going to bring it out. Um, I have it here. Uh, I uh, commissioned the Gallup organization. I'm looking for the... Uh, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. Where is it? Where is it? I can't put, I should have had it before I got on the call, but I have a study and I want you to see it. We wouldn't, wouldn't think I'm not telling the truth. Where is it? I can't put my finger on it right now, but, oh, it's over here. This other, other drawer. I commissioned the Gallup organization about six years ago to do a major study on the difference between networking habits between black people and white people. Now, our company could have done the same study, but we knew that black people would believe white people before they believe black people. So we commissioned white people to do it. All right. That's a whole nother story. And here's what they found. They found that black people spent half the amount hey, of pressure? time. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, it looks like I might have lost him for a second. No, no, can you hear uh, me? I can hear you. Uh, Dr. Frederick, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Tell I me. If you got, uh, yes. You can hear me? Okay, okay. You, you froze for a second. Please continue. Okay, all right, all right. So um, we commissioned the Gallup organization to do this study, and they found in this study, it was a national study, that Black people spend half the amount of time cultivating and building relationships at work at home and in the community. We spent on average about six hours a week doing that. Most black people at that time didn't even think networking was important. White people spent between 14 and 17 hours a week. Therefore, white people had about 185 well-cultivated and developed relationships. Uh, and we had somewhere around 54. 
So we had almost a third of the developed relationships that we needed to cultivate and develop businesses and to develop and have access to resources, right? So my point is, and I want to encourage all of our brothers and sisters out here, spend more time working on cultivating and developing relationships at work, at home, in the community. Everything, especially business, is about relationship. There's just no question about it. I have sold $75 million, and I'm not bragging, I'm just giving you a fact here. I've sold $75 million in sponsorships in my career to the various things that I've produced, be it the Power Networking Conference or a myriad of other things I've produced in our community that required serious money through sponsorship, public and private sector sponsorship. But I have never sold one penny of sponsorship to someone I did not have a close personal friendship with. So that's what is required. You have to cultivate, you have to invest the time and work at home and in the community and cultivating and building relationships. That's really the whole message in my book that I wrote 25 years ago, Success Runs in Our Race, The Complete Guide to Effective Networking in the African American community. What is the key to building a business? Relationships, relationships, relationships. Introduce me to your five closest friends and that will tell me who you are. As they know and as they go, you go. Therefore, what does that mean? It means don't spend major time with minor people. People going nowhere want you to go nowhere with them. People doing nothing want you to do nothing with them. If you want to change your life, change your damn relationships. If you're not where you want to be in business uh, or in your profession, it's just check your friends. It's your friends. It's your relationships. If you do not have what you want in life, it's because you do not have the relationships you need to get you what you want in life. You cannot do it by yourself. You will do it with and through other people. This is biblical. John 530 direct quote from Jesus Christ. And there are not that many direct quotes from Jesus Christ in the Bible. There are 800,000 words in the Bible. Only 1,025 words are direct quotes from Jesus Christ. This is one sentence from Jesus Christ, John 5.30. And Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Now, this was Jesus Jesus couldn't get it done on his own by himself in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything significant, anything worth talking about on your own by yourself in a vacuum? It is all about relationships. It's all about connecting the dots. God has given black people everything they need to succeed. We have everything we need to succeed except each other. Jews have each other. East Indians have each other. Arabs have each other. Right? Asians have each other. We don't have the relationships with each other. Now, there's a whole lot of psychological baggage for that being the reason. But we have to, we have to mend that. We have to get our minds right. right. And this is what Garvey said, right, a hundred years ago, until we get our mind right. We will not get where we're going. This is the same thing with Ambassador Arcana has said. Until we get our minds right, nothing will change in our culture globally, right? Until we build relationships, until we're doing better and building businesses and trusting each other so that we can build the businesses. That requires cultivating, nurturing, and building the relationship, uh, listening more than you talk, right? Uh, being empathetic, um, being helpful, and fulfilling the purpose of life. The purpose of life, Doc, is very simple. It is to love, to give, to serve, and to add the highest value to somebody or something every minute of every day. Let me say that again. What is the purpose of life, Doc? It is to love, to give, to serve, and to add the highest value to somebody or something every minute of every day of your life. And this is how we bond, and this is how we cultivate relationships, and this is how we work together, and this is how we do business. It's based on relationships, which requires high emotional intelligence, 
right? What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is your ability to manage the five most important emotions in your body and use the management of those emotions to cultivate, nurture, and to develop relationships at work, at home, and in the community, right? This is what we're missing. And because we're not taught this, and so we're just using instincts that have poisoned our thinking and we have been divided and conquered. But the moment 1.6 billion Africans come together, all hell will break loose. I mean, we will demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that we are a force to, work, to be reckoned with. But as long as we are like this and they are like that, we will never win. That's what you help do. Wow. That's what you help do. You really do. Um, you have a huge following because you have bonded. You go out and you meet people. What you're saying resonates with people. You teach people. You inspire people. You empower people. Right? You, you give your, your every uh, awakened moment to teaching our people. So you, your brand, your persona, your you is about loving, giving, serving, and adding value to people. This is why so many people watch you, love you, and talk about you, right? You have cultivated and built relationships with your people by serving them, giving to them, unselfishly training them it's, and, and getting from them a fair market value in return for what you give to them. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the only way it can exist. So well, well, these are the things that we have to learn. Well, thank you. Um, and, I, and I will say this, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, we all got to learn things from somebody, you know, and, uh, and I want to make sure everybody knows that I, I can't I can't do this without guys like you, you know, um, without without the things you taught me. I, I remember I remember going to the first power, my first power networking conference back in 2006. And uh, and I remember just being in awe of, of everything I saw there. And, you know, and I think that in, in general, um, as a community for, for African-Americans, I, I really am am really uh, a believer that one of the key um, aspects of our comeback, if you will, uh, if our ri of our rise is going to be the rise of the black man, you know, the rise of the black man in his, you know, true purpose uh, as a leader, as a king, as, as the, you know, as, as the strength in the room. And, um, and I think that one of the reasons that I uh, admire you and respect you so much uh, and yourself and other, other, other individuals, you know, everybody from Dr. Ron Daniels, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, Minister Louis Farrakhan, Kenny Gamble, and many others going across the board. Michael Roberts is that, um, you know, I, I think there's something special about the black man who is his own man. Um, there, there, you know, and, and I, I cannot, uh, I, I, I feel badly for the black man who hasn't found his purpose, uh, who's only found his, uh, his calling in white supremacist stereotypes of what a black man is supposed to be, you know, because right. many of us, and I'm sure people in here can relate mm -hmm. to this. Many of us have had, mm -hmm. you know, the, the uncle that was the alcoholic or, or, you know, or the, or the, you know, the, or the relative that was really in the struggle. And, uh, and my heart goes out uh, to those guys, but I really think that a big part of building a better community is going to come down to us really taking over the process of building a better black man. Because right now hey, our, black, our, our black men are being built in the wrong factories. So right. they're really remember, defective products. Remember what Richard, Richard Smith said in this piece that I read to everybody. He said, and I quote, we force them to speak and write in our languages. They even judge each other by how much one can speak like us. Right? That's the standard of excellence for too many black people is how white can we be? You know, uh, and uh, right. And so, so that it is very difficult to, to, to express and to be the power of you being something else. Right. I mean, was it Shakespeare that said it to thy own self be true. Right. To thy own self. 
So we have to do us. We can't do them. We can learn from them and the things that we can do that we can do better. We have our own unique strengths and we must continue to exploit those unique strengths. There's much more that we can learn, no question about that, but we still have to be who God made us. We are African-centered people. We are not Eurocentric people. We can't be like them on the real and be the most productive and the most powerful people that we can be on this earth, right? The minute someone takes you out of you, they have control of you, right? They ultimately will dominate you because you ain't you, <laughs> right? The minute we become <laughs> us, right? The minute we're psychologically healed, that will take more time and more effort, Um. Uh, you know, we've heard it a million times. Uh, you know, white men have said it. White men are afraid of black men. They say this. They admit this. Mm. Well, we cannot disagree with them, Doc. They should be afraid. Mm. They know who we are. They <laughs> should really be afraid. No question about that, right? We ought to be feared, because we know who we are. We know what we're capable of when we are us, when we were straight up Africans in Egypt. And remember, Egypt is in Africa. It is not in the Middle East 5,000 years before uh, Christ. We, and when we were doing us with no interruptions, we built the first and greatest civilizations on earth for that period. When we began to get infected did, let's call it that, by them, all of that power was dissipated, right? And so the script was flipped. They became the power. We became less than who we really were, right? Because we're operating out of our, out of our comfort zone of who, yes, we are God's first people. Black men and black women are some of the most powerful people on earth. Our sperm is even more alive and more powerful than any sperm on earth. Wow. Wow. So what I think it was John Henry Clark who said, the center of the world is between the legs of a black woman. That is the power of the world between the legs of a black woman, right? That's how powerful we are. And wow. let's, um, let's not ever forget that, brothers and sisters. Live in your own power. Be who you really are. And be the, be the best that you can be. And we won't have anything to worry about. Right Our time will come again. Was it the first shall be last, but the last shall be first? Our time will come again. Right? As I said in Africa, it is easy to break a finger. It is hard to break a fist. The strength is not in the wolf. The strength is in the pack. Once we understand that deeply, um, we will demonstrate to the world that we are forced to be reckoned with. But they already know that. All right. <laughs> well, 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 I love it. I love it. And if everybody could, uh, could you please uh, join me in giving uh, Dr. Frazier a digital round of applause? Uh, a big thank you for coming in and dropping knowledge and not just inspiration, but actually giving us solutions. Uh, you know, we, we, we all feel good right now uh, from, from everything that Dr. Frazier said. But what, what I love the most as well is, um, is th th this is, this is uh, scientifically proven to actually work. And uh, what I really want you to do is to start uh, deprogramming yourself and getting away from whatever mm -hmm. nonsense you were taught and learn, learn, learn the keys to success in your life. Learn how to get what you want out of life. Uh, Talk you, to the elders. Talk to you're an elder. You're a young elder, but you're an elder, Dr. Dr. Watkins. You really are. You have a lot of wisdom for your age. Talk to the elders, listen to the elders. In fact, that's something, that's a, a component of the Power Networking Conference that we are going to add in succeeding years. And that is connecting through discussion elders and younger generations. 
we know that the youth can walk faster, but the elder knows the road, right? Mm. <laughs> right? So two, I'm finished on two things. Come to the Power Networking Conference next year in Houston, Texas, July 8th through the 11th. You can go on powernetworkconference.com. Uh, www.powernetworkconference.com and get and give someone a Christmas gift. In fact, you know what? Now that I think about it, maybe I'll have a Black Friday offer uh, on the Power Networking Conference. Right? So there you go. go www.powernetworkingconference.com and of course, Dr. Boyce Watkins uh, is going to be one of our featured speakers. Uh, Dr. Julius Garvey is going to be there this year and give a talk uh, as well. So it's going to be off the chain. Uh, uh, that's uh, www.powernetworkingconference.com. And then finally, we have launched Fraser Nation. www.onefrasernation.com. www.onefrasernation.com. We have a special offer for those who want to become citizens of Fraser Nation. It's 70% off for the first year of citizenship of Fraser Nation, 70% off. Your taxes or your nationhood fees are reduced by 70%. You get the first year almost next to nothing, okay? So just go check it out, onefrasernation.com, onefrasernation.com. Check it out, apply for citizenship because you have to apply. This is not a membership-based um, uh, initiative. This is a citizen. This is a country that we are digitizing and bringing global nationhood to. So that's those are my my, my two offers, if you will. Check them out. And um, I think well, maybe we do this one more time before the end of the year. Yeah. Right. Is yeah. Uh, last two? Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. We do. We do. And okay. uh, and actually, I'll say this. Um, I'll tell you what. I have some really good moderators because one of the moderators just reminded me that my wedding date is July 11th, but I, I still want to come to the conference. So I'd like to know maybe if there's a way for you and I to, you know, to talk, coordinate schedules so I can fly in and participate and still, and not yeah. upset my bride. So, <laughs> I, I, I did, I did, July I the 11th? Yeah, but I, I didn't even God. know. I had no idea, but, but I, I and I, so I got to go talk to my assistant to find out how we had the scheduling conflict, but I'm still coming. So don't make no mistake about it, because I can fly into Houston and fly back. No, no, I, I got an idea for you. I got an idea for you. Hold on. I want you to just hold on. I, I will show you something. I got an idea. Okay. Oh. Take your time. Take your time. Uh, everybody who's watching, thank you, Duel, by the way, for telling me that. I, I had no idea. Uh, and uh, and actually, uh, jo uh, George, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, because I'm actually going to let him know that he's being he's invited to my wedding as well. So if he can make I want to show you something. I want I, I want to show you something. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah, sure can. That's a bishop and his beautiful wife. They had been coming to the conference for about 10 years. And they decided instead of getting married in his church, they got married at the Power Networking Conference. <laughs> they, had, they had a thousand people at their wedding free of charge. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> they got at the power. So this was the this was the first <laughs> wedding. At the Power Networking Conference, right? <laughs> we can make we can right get married. And we will set it all up for you, right? You're talking about a low cost wedding with thousands of people, right? To be center stage, right? We can marry you at the Power Networking Conference, man. <laughs> you are killing me. I, <laughs> we I, can invite I, all of her family <laughs> and invite, and we'll, we'll let them in free. Right, and we'll let your family will let them in free, and we will put on one hell. You have a built-in audience. You have 1,500 people already at your wedding, right? <laughs> and you won't have to spring for the meals. Man, you are you, that. That is, I'm going to plead the fifth on that one because if I say another word, I will incriminate myself with the woman <laughs> in the house who who will, will kill me if I make any decisions without without talking no, to her no, about it. But no, but I, you I know, know what. I, but but you know that's that's a really really compelling offer. I I tell you, I, let me go talk to her about that and see what we can work out. Because we were going to do a big wedding down on Southside Chicago at the Rockefeller Chapel, uh, and uh, but but I, this does sound really good. So I may let me look at the schedule and see if we can work this. We would turn, and we would turn our big luncheon. You know, we have the big luncheon. 
we would turn that into a wedding. That's oh, what we man. would do. Oh, man. <laughs> this brother's killing me. He's killing me. He's killing me with kindness. That, right? that, that is well, a, half the people. <laughs> certainly half the people there know you already anyway, right? Yeah. At least. So it's not like you'll be doing it among strangers. I mean, you're doing it among family and fans. Right? Oh, man. What, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Give, give me a quick vote. What do you guys think? You, you, I see a lot of people saying, go for it. Uh, AK Rowe, go for it, boys. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Oh my gosh! Wow! Well, let me go talk to Alicia because that that is a that is a hell of an offer. And I, I was going to introduce you to Alicia regardless because I, I know that uh she she has been talking about you all the time, and uh, I'm going to go see what she says because I'm in fact I'm going to show her this video and this part of it so that gonna, she, she can hear the I'm offer. Gonna, uh, no, you don't want to do. It? I'm going to text you that picture. Okay. No. Yeah. I'll I'll text you the picture, uh, or I will um yeah I'll figure out how to get that photo to you. <laughs> I'll send it to your assistant. She'll give it to you, right? And you can show that this is evident. This, this is real, right? This is real. The 2016, look at that. Look how beautiful they look, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> how happy they look, right? Right? Now, this is a bishop, right? This is, this is, I mean, he had a major, major congregation. He he got married at the Power Networking Conference. I mean, they, they, him and it was his wife. They wanted to do it together, Right? He said, of course, his church criticized him for that, right? Oh, really? Right? That would be unbelievable. Man, you know, let me go talk to Alicia about that. That is uh, that talk to her. I, I, I am humbled by that offer, man. That is uh that is that is uh an absolute privilege. And and I just want you guys, in, in case you guys are not aware, you know, Dr. Frazier is a big shot. And so uh, I'm just gonna tell you, it's not lost upon me that it is an honor to even have conversations with you. Um, and uh, and to have you as a mentor and to and to connect with you and, and speak to you as much as I have and uh, and I'm gonna say you gave me a lot to think about man and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion please uh, give Dr. Frazier a big thank you for everything that he's brought to the table today and all the other times he's come in and uh, in fact go search for the other interviews because they're all very instructive you learn more from talking to men like this than you learn from any professor you ever had in college I guarantee it. So these are your teachers. These are the individuals that can get you where you want to get to. And uh, and I want to say thank you again, man. Uh, this is this is great. And I'm gonna go. I, my my jaws are tired from all the grinning. <laughs> you got me falling out of my seat, brother. But I'll, I'll, I, I, and when, when we make the decision, when Alicia and I make the decision on that, um, I will let everyone know what we're planning to do. And uh, and also, I'm do not do not mark me off that calendar because I'm definitely still gonna be there. And uh, we will we're just gonna make yeah. that schedule work. No, we'll. Yeah. Either way, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll, you know, you'll do your thing at the conference. You'll get to your wedding one way or the other. Right? Hopefully it's there. If not, we'll get you where you need to go. But uh, all right. This is awesome, man. All right. Yes, see. it is. Yes, it happy is. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, same to you, brother. Same to you. And th happy Thanksgiving to everybody watching. And God bless you. Please hit the thumbs up button on your way out, guys. And don't forget, if you want to learn more about the Power Networking Conference, you can go to PowerNetworkingConference.com. That's PowerNetworkingConference.com. So go check that out, guys. And uh, and I'll let you guys know about the trip to Ghana, which starts on December 6th. I'm going to take a lot of footage while I'm there. And uh, I encourage you to go research this as well. Thank you. Hey, you know what? You know what? If someone wants a special Black Friday offer on the conference, this is like a crazy offer, have them email me. I'm not going to talk about it now. If they're interested in it, it's a special Black Friday. It's a private Black Friday offering for anybody that's interested in coming to the Power Network. Come, just email me, and, and uh, I'll send you this crazy offer by email. So it's gfraser at frasernet.com. If you're interested in a Black Friday offer for the registration at the conference for next year in July, uh, but, but go on the site and take a look at it first, and then let me know. All right, that's gfraser at frasernet.com. Frasernet.com. F-R-A-S-E-R. At FraserNet.com. F-R-A-S-E-R. -E G-Fraser at FraserNet.com. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, brother. It's very great to talk to you as always. And thank you guys. And have a wonderful day. And uh, we will see you guys soon. Take care now. Bye -bye. All right now. Bye-bye.